I'd like maybe to start with um, a question for, for, for Dave. Um, why and when did Google get into the enterprise uh, game? <clears throat> well, that was a nice introduction. My mother couldn't have done better, so I appreciate <laughs> that. Um, well, you know, I, I don't think there was ever a, a moment in time where Google decided it was going to be in the enterprise. Larry, I think Larry and Sergey, you know, never had a concept of enterprise consumer. They, they pretty much saw people as people. Um, by the time they were, they were at Google, they were in their first jobs, and they discovered they had to spend a lot of time in the workplace, you know. And uh, Google sort of always rallies around solving problems that impact enormous numbers of people, the whole world, if you will, in very acute ways that they believed computer science could address. I mean, that's probably the most fundamental thing Larry and Sergey wanted to do. And it so happens that hundreds of millions of us spend a lot, a lot of our lives in the workplace, and problems of information access are and have always been particularly acute there. So that's, that's as simple as it gets at Google. There's no grand plan. There's no estimating from Gartner how big the market is or this and that. It really is, are there big problems there? Yes. Do, are they ones Google could probably add some value to? Yes. Let's get started. OK. And uh, it just grew from there. OK, so whilst I'm asking questions, can you, can you think of questions as well? Because in a minute, I'm going to turn it over to you to ask those questions that you'd like to have answered by, uh, by Dave and Alan. Uh, another question for you, Dave, before we go on to Alan. What, what, can, what can Google learn from the enterprise market and vice versa? A lot. I, you know, I, I'm in a unique role because I spend a lot of my time amongst those in the enterprise market, people like yourselves, and probably half of my time out learning, listening, and the other half of my time inside Google, understanding Google. And it, in, in some sense, I feel like a, some sort of crazy transformer trying to make these worlds understand each other. But th there really is a lot to learn in both ways. And you know, Google is very special in how it works. It's very unique um, and not without its quirks. Um, and, and for sure, you know, Google has had to learn what it means to be an enterprise player. And we are continuing to learn that. But as I always say, you know, you know, for example, we acquired Postini a couple of years ago. They were a company that was a, born as an enterprise company. And, and they had real you know, enterprise DNA, so to speak. And my, my view is you know, Google's DNA is what Google's DNA is, right? It's very pure. Uh, having said that, it can be extended. It can grow. And so my task at Google has always been um, appreciate what is special about the company. Don't ever try to change what is special about the company, but extend it and get it to embrace the world of enterprise IT, which has a lot of very special you know, needs and requirements. And I think that's been the delicate balance is I don't really want to change Google. I probably need to try to change the enterprise market a little bit uh, and hopefully meet somewhere in the middle. And I think you know, so far we've been able to do that. So Alan, we've heard today that Google builds uh, data centers as well as, com as well as computers. How can that make sense? Well, I mean, I, I was one of the people uh, that went through the transformation of uh, consolidation of data centers. You know, I really thought with uh, Moore's Law and other kinds of things that, uh, you know, eventually you get to the point where, you know, all the information that you ever needed in your whole world was on a device like this. Um, and I was wrong. I mean, massively wrong, not slightly wrong, <laughs> and uh, which is not that unusual. But the... Uh, but the problem is, is that it is true that these devices are getting better and better at storing information. But the amount of information that any one person needs at any one time has just gone up you know, dramatically. I mean, sure, I might be able to fit the Library of Congress on this device, but no longer is that enough. You know, <laughs> I need all the satellite imagery. I need all the maps. I need all the street view. I need all news. I need all the web. I need everything has to be here. And, uh, and so I was wrong on that. And so when it, when it comes to, uh, uh, to you know, Google and what caused us to get where we are, um, it, it really is, is the fact that this whole mission of organizing the world's information and making it universally accessible has gotten more complicated. And as a result, we've had to build more and more infrastructure uh, to be able to do that. And no longer will small devices do. Now, Honestly, it requires you know huge data centers, and then it requires you know networks of data centers around the world because you want the latency to be low. And so you know then if you have that model, it requires you to 
you know, deal with fault tolerance. And then you have to deal with better networking because the clusters have to, it's so much easier to program things with low latency and high bandwidth networks. And then, well, now I have to do my own networking. And, and so it's a ball. It seems like a simple problem. And it just gets worse every day. <laughs> OK, so maybe just building on that, can, can Google serve businesses on the same infrastructure uh, that it services customers, consumers? Well, what's, what's funny about that question, and, and, and Dave touched on this a little bit, is sometimes we bumble into things. And so on the day that Gmail launched, uh, many of you remember, I remember, it was on April 1st. And it was, it was a, gigab a gigabyte per person. And everybody thought that was so outlandish that they thought it was an April Fool's joke. And uh, it is always a bad idea, by the way, to launch on April 1st or something. <laughs> Because then a half the half the the, uh, the newspapers said it was an April, April April Fool's joke, and then half tried to give us you know real coverage, and that the half that thought it was an April Fool's joke was really mad at us, and so, uh, <laughs> but we launched, and then immediately we got lots of feedback saying, look, this is fantastic. I mean, it's really good. I wish I had this in my business. Isn't there? But you know, I really don't feel like I can use like Gmail.com as my domain name. <laughs> Could you please give me any solution? And so, it was actually a relatively short hack at that point to allow you to do you know uh, Gmail for your domain, and that's what got us into it. It wasn't a it wasn't a plan. It was that there was demand from people that said, "Look, this is a better solution." Um, than I have in my enterprise. It, it, it's funny, it, it, it did grow out of running Gmail, but having your own custom domain, a, a simple concept that the Gmail team actually uh, came up with. And I remember as it came together, you know, we went to Eric and we said, we're gonna launch this. You know, it was first for universities and then for businesses, and you know, what do you think? And uh, he's, he was all for it, but at the time, somebody had come up with the genius name of Google Hosted Services. And he, <laughs> as we're walking out of the room, he goes, by the way, that name sucks, please fix it. <laughs> Literally, we were launching in two days, and the uh, best we could come up with was Google Apps, and it uh, stuck ever since. But what was, fun, what was also funny is that, uh, is that we had the same problems inside the company that you guys you know, faced in that. So we started Gmail inside the company because we, that we used it ourselves. And then we decided to launch a consumer offering. So we did. We you know, cloned it and things. But we had two different systems, one that we used internally and one we used for consumers. And it was a nightmare, because now we had to keep the two things consistent. We had to have you know, 24 by 7 uh, you know, uh, support for both of them and things like that. And I remember being at a meeting with Larry Page while the IT people were there. Larry says, why do you have two systems? Why don't you have just one? And the IT people were saying, oh, well, what about security? You know, what's what's going to happen if our corporate secrets basically you know, get switched over in some things you know, with our consumers? And Larry just says, don't you feel like my secrets are important too <laughs> as a user? <laughs> and I mean, you know, you see the jaws drop. It's like, well, uh, Larry, uh, no, you know. And, uh, and, you know, we also had teams of people that were doing that. And so Larry made an edict, said, you know, we are switching to the standard infrastructure. We're going to eliminate a private in-house, you know, copy of Gmail, and everybody's going to use the standard system. And that forced everybody to not develop in two paths and to develop security systems and mechanisms that actually would work for both consumer and for enterprise. And I, I think it was a good move, and it was an important move for the company. There may well be enough advertising revenue, but um, we're not, you know, my experience is most businesses, and when I say businesses, I tend to think of once you get beyond a dozen people or so. My opinion is very small businesses act more or less like consumers. But when you get into real size businesses, they aren't really interested in a free product. It signals lack of commitment. It, it, there's question about whether you're really investing in this. Um, so in my opinion, I wouldn't want to, at, at scale, you'd, I, I don't think a business wants to use a free service. They want to ha have a service, frankly, that's profitable because that is indicative that the company is committed to it, is building a real business, will continue to invest and make it better in the future, can support you, you know. And, and so we talked about that. I mean, it certainly could be an option. And by the way, we do have a free ad-supported version for very small businesses. That's extraordinarily popular. Um, <laughs> but... Uh, but you know, at, Google didn't invent itself as an advertising company, and we don't see that as the only way we can earn revenue over time. And we do differentiate our offerings. I mean, uh, 
before it was exactly the same service, every, treated everybody identically and things like that. And, uh, and I believe that's good in some ways, but, uh, but I think our enterprise customers actually are more demanding and therefore we've changed some things inside the company. Uh, it's not that we, we, we treat cu uh, normal customers uh, you know, badly, our, our uh, you know, consumer customers badly, uh, but we have gotten to the point where we say that you know, these customers mean more you know, to us and therefore we do distinguish our service. Like I'll give you an example. Uh, we have these, uh, these orders that say, you know, we're gonna do maintenance on these particular things. And because of the way we build our systems, uh, we fail over. I mean, whole data centers can fail, and, it's, and, and it actually causes no problems at all um, in that. But it does introduce a little bit of risk, right? And so normally we just rotate these things around the clock. Uh, but for our business customers, we decided, well, let's not do them in the normal rotation. Let's, let's actually shift that over to the weekends you know, for them so that they never even have the chance, basically, for one of these things to have some kind of cascading failure. And so... Uh, so I do think that it's really important for us to differentiate our, our enterprise customers, and we do that. Other questions? I saw the hand over here. We'll, we'll move across to the other side in, in a moment, so please. Uh, Dominic Schein, CIO of Read Exhibitions. Got a question about Chrome operating system and how that relates to enterprise. What we talked about today, I think, is a very attractive proposition of moving to Google Apps, Salesforce, and so on, but also the reality that there are a number of on-premise applications that will be around for a while, which lead us back to the conclusion of, oh my God, we've got to stick with Microsoft Windows on the desktop and so on. What are the ambitions for Chrome OS, and are you planning you know, to make a play in the enterprise space that would give us other options there? Well. Um Chrome OS, uh, the, the concept there is everything is in a browser, right? So, so clearly it does not conceive of running your thick client HR applications, et cetera, and I wouldn't anticipate you know, it would be a solution for that. Having said that, a lot of businesses are moving uh, more of their users to the cloud, and in some cases, you know, a huge part of your user base may end up purely using web-based applications because you, I mean, there, there's companies that I hear of that are moving toward a, a, you know, a stipend for compute, right? Get a laptop, lease it, whatever you want to do. We don't want to hear about it. Um, and when you start to think about that model where there's, or at least for some, there is nothing installed other than a browser, then I think the client that you would choose would probably change over time to something that is more durable, more secure, very focused in what it does, uh, very fast at what it does, probably more energy efficient, things like that. So I think there'll be a place for Chrome OS. I, we, we aren't there saying, oh, we're looking to displace Windows off for all your desktops, et cetera. There'll be a, a lot of room for Windows, I'm sure, for as long as any of us will be around. But I think there ought to be some choices. And some of your employees may well not need anything other than a browser. And you may prefer to have a device that lasts longer, takes less power, doesn't require visits to the desktop, et cetera. So I would say yes. I, it is important to say that you know we, we We've said um, Chrome OS is something we're targeting for the end of next year. We will start focused on the consumer um, because we think that makes sense to do so, and that's where the pace of innovation can happen quickest. But we definitely believe over time there's a great opportunity to you know, help your businesses as well. well let me add to that that uh, you know, Chrome OS is a really interesting idea. I mean, the idea that most of us spend most of our time in our browsers is just... Uh, was unthinkable a long time ago. But now I spent, I literally, I spend 98% of my time in a browser. And if I do spend all that time in the browser, why do I need, you know, all the stuff underneath it? There, and why don't I spend all, and by the way, the browser is, you know, basically it does multitasking, it handles failover, it does all kinds of things for me anyway. So what kind of operating system do I need underneath it? And it turns out it's really small. And then why don't I use all of the resources that are available there you know, like memory and other things. Use it to cache applications. Use it to cache data. You know, use it to do all these other things. The moment I introduce an application that gets downloaded onto that system, I break all my security models. I break all the simplicity. I break everything else. And with HTML5 and internet-delivered applications, I can get almost all that advantage really quickly. And I'm even getting the performance that I haven't seen before. So, so, so I, I really do believe that there's some big advantages there. Um, 
But you know, there are also solutions that are out there for, you know, I mean, there's a lot of people who are using virtualization and VNCs and other kinds of things to provide access for those that tiny subset of people that really desperately need, you know, to run this Windows application. But I, I think they're, it's going to go down over time. Yeah, I promised a question over this way, so let's go. It, uh, yeah. Um, as an organization that is uh, in, the, in, in the middle of migrating um, from our legacy uh, mail solution to uh, uh, Google Apps and Google Mail. Um, Thank you. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, it's not, it's not without its difficulties. It's not without its challenges in terms of encryption and security and single sign-on and things like that. Are, are, are Google going to develop, if you like, a suite of uh, migration tools that, that, that de-risk uh, the migration and uh, you know, perhaps help make it more predictable? That's a, that's a fair statement. Um, let me say, when we first launched Google Apps, we frankly had no migration tools. So, uh, and, uh, you know, full knowledge, a lot of the earlier customers that moved to Google Apps had little choice uh, but to not take their data with them or to go through some fairly painful processes to move data client by client, et cetera. So we've come a long way f since then, but we certainly aren't all the way there. We, we happen to be what I would consider very solid, quite good moving Lotus to Google for whatever reason. Heck of a lot of people seem to have done that and pushed that, and our tools are very good there. And I should say, around messaging and calendaring, et cetera, moving Lotus applications is a whole different uh, question, as most of you are probably aware. Um, on the Microsoft side, we are improving, but we're not as quite there yet. We, we will, this quarter, uh, finally release the, the, the full server-side version of migration tools to get all the data you need to out of Exchange. Um, and we're beginning down the path of, of <clears throat> having tools to move things out of SharePoint into Google Sites, et cetera. So we, we are working very hard on migration tools. They're not perfect, though. They are much, much better than they were even six months ago. Uh, we will continue to have work to do, particularly on the application side. When you think about your Lotus apps or your SharePoint apps or whatever, you want to get, get rid of those, shut those servers down. Um, it will never be point and click for those things, but we do believe on the messaging side Frankly, it ought to be point and click. You do have to still think about things like how much data do you want to move through your firewall? How much, how much email do you want to keep? Um, the, the data model of calendars, calendars is actually horrendously complex, right? Trying to move uh, calendars from one system to another, you know, how Lotus handles holidays and how it reschedules meetings around. It, there's all sorts of weird corner cases. So it will never be perfect, but our goal should be you can make a few quick decisions about how much, what you want to move and what trade-offs you're willing to make and it can be entirely predictable from that point on. And I, I think we're actually getting uh, better at that, though certainly not perfect. OK, any questions over this side? I mean, we're, we haven't had any from over here. OK, uh, Carsten? And then I saw a few hands over here. We'll come, we'll come to you right yeah. afterwards. Yeah. Uh, just a very brief one to address sort of the innovation model that Google is using. Uh, this idea that you that the difference between a product and the service is generally that you, you can own a product but you don't own the service. So of course uh, all the nice features that suddenly are there next time I log on, it's excellent as a consumer and you're sort of more prepared for that kind of, of, of innovation that happens from the sent out to the, to the edges. Uh, so I'm just wondering whether you have been considering the challenges that might emerge to that innovation model once you engage with large corporations who, who might expect a different kind of process or might it be so that they'll They'll have to get used to this is the new world of innovation right. processes. Yeah, th there's probably no place more ripe for where does Google meet enterprise um, and, and, and have to sort of navigate th than this area, which is how, does, how is technology delivered and consumed? And without question, uh, if you are in a traditional IT role where you are used to having upgrade is coming next year, we're going to prep, we're going to sandbox, we're going to see who, we're going to set up training courses, we're going to, you know, gone. All of that's gone. Um, now, we, we do a bit better than just saying, shows up Monday morning and everybody has a new calendar system. Um, the, the truth is these applications do grow and change slowly and surely every week. Literally, it, most teams are on two-week launch cycles, sometimes things you would never notice, a little performance thing, sometimes small tweaks. Now, when there are big changes, I want to talk about big changes and small changes. When there are big changes, things that anybody would notice, we, we are uh, fairly good at now giving you um, the choice, opt in or opt out or you know, automatically turn on or wait and let you evaluate it. So the IT, the administrator of the system has a lot of choices about uh, when big changes come. 
So I don't think we have issues there. Small changes, and of course where the line is is probably a good question, there's a lot of trust involved because we, aren't, we, we don't have an opt-in button for every small change. What we do have is a fairly significant focus group of 100 million people or so who we will, for example, if we're going to add a, move a button to the right a little bit in Gmail, we'll release it to a tenth of a percent of people for 10 minutes and have a few million data points about how people react to that. So while yes, you have to have a level of trust that these applications are going to grow and change, um, that trust I think we, over time people will get very comfortable with. And it's funny, somebody was asking me about this, I said, for every 10 complaints I hear about when are you going to give us X, Y, and Z features, when are you going to finish your mail migrate, whatever it would be, I hear zero about we really didn't want that, literally zero. I don't, it doesn't. It's one of those things I think that is intuitive that it should be a problem, but I have yet to hear it a problem for the reasons I described. It, it, it is a different model for sure, and it takes a while for people to get comfortable with it. Now, this is a philosophical thing too. I remember uh, Toolbar, when we first released Toolbar, you know, Larry was insistent, I want it to auto-update. And at the time, nobody auto-updated because the risks are too high. You know, we have like millions and millions of toolbars out there. What happens if they all stop working? What, have, you know, what happens if we can't auto-update again if we make a mistake? Larry says, I want it auto-updated all the time. He says, if we have a bug, I want to fix it. You know, I don't want to wait. If there's a security issue, I want it fixed. I don't want us to deal with, you know, you know, a thousand different versions of toolbar out there. I want there to be one. You do not have a choice. You use our software, you get it auto-updated. And, and, and then we force our teams to just test really, really heavily to make sure that we're not screwing them up. But the result is, you know, if you compare that model to other companies where you're constantly being bombarded, you know, well, we got a new update for you. We got a new, do you want to accept <laughs> it? And you think, they don't tell you what the heck it is. They just said you want your software updated. I mean, what choice are they really giving me? And so I think there's a philosophy of updating things. And I think there's, you know, it's, it's kind of thrilling to come in every once in a while and say, wow, video chat. <laughs> you know, who would have thought, you know? <laughs> now, maybe somebody doesn't want video chat, you know, and that kind of stuff. But, but uh, you know, just that breaks the whole model, right? I didn't have to pay $50 for it, you know? I didn't have to schedule it, you know, far in advance. All of a sudden, I got something. Translation. It just appeared. You know, you get this thing in your mailbox that's in a different language, and you say, it says, do you want to translate it? And you hit yes, and it's there. Um, I, I think consumers will, will expect that uh, in the future. And I don't think when it comes right down to it, if you had, like we do, I mean, a great administrator panel that says yes or no to video chat, you know, you know, I think most, most people will say, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll take that. Okay, so over to you, please. How is your position to service the corporate market in the future? Coming back to Jeffrey Moore's model of, do you want to do this on a standalone basis or on a network with uh, outsourcing service providers and integrators? Well, uh, I, I would say philosophically, we kind of answered this question when we started into enterprise. And we decided that Google was a product company. We didn't aim to be a global services solution, blah, blah, blah. There's a, not, there's a lot of those, and they're very good at it. Um, so <laughs> we really said, and frankly, it's probably slowed us down, because it's always easier to go into a company and say, we will do everything for you. Just sign here and you know, sit back. Uh, but in reality, we, we did not aim to be, become Accenture or IBM Global Services or anything. So we have purposefully pulled partners in, because no matter how good we make the services, the integration to the enterprise environment will always require some help. Migration of data, single sign-on integration, Active Directory, whatever it would be. And so we are growing partnerships with people like Accenture and Capgemini um, and CSC and others. And, and those are the big guys. There's probably you know, 100 times the number of guys you've never heard of who are becoming cloud service providers. And they're just experts at the change management, the te technical bits. But you know, we're very clear. I mean, our goal is to make this as much turn on as possible, right? And, and, and we don't want to be in that, in that business. We want to make this a service you can turn on when you need it and turn off when you don't. Um, and stick with what we're good at. And I, I don't know if it's the ultimate right answer. I'm sure uh, we are. I, I should say, by the way, for the big companies like Jaguar, Land Rover, and, and others who are with us early, 
we're taking a little different approach. We are very hands-on, and we make 100% sure that their project is successful because they're amongst the earlier adopters. So we're very, but, but we don't bill for services and do that kind of stuff at all because our goal really is to enable you know, an ecosystem to grow. Okay, there was another question over here. <clears throat> I'm Vikram from uh, Wipro Technologies. Uh, two questions. So one, uh, we've heard a lot about G Drive. Is it really getting launched or? <laughs> That's one. And second is, uh, you know, you've heard about so many customer case studies. Uh, so what I want to really ask is, are the customers shifting all their users to Google Apps or uh, is the hybrid model more prevalent? We are, they are shifting most of the users, but they still have a core set of users you know, in the enterprise with the legacy environment. So what's the trend? Um, G Drive, let me answer that one. Um, <laughs> we, we obviously don't announce things that haven't been launched, so we aren't gonna, we don't have any product to announce today. We generally want the cloud to be a place where you store your data. Um, it doesn't always have to be in our formats. Um, we think you should better store photos and you should better store, you know, CAD diagrams and anything you feel like storing. So you're going to see a lot more from us in that regard. So we don't, you know, G Drive is a little bit of a, imagining the world as you see it today, which is a mounted hard drive on your desktop. To me, that's, it may or may not be interesting. The interesting part is, can you actually move the mass of your data into the cloud, either as a consumer or as a business user, access it from any device, and have really full fidelity, reliable, fast access from anywhere? That we will do. Exactly how we'll do it, I would hold off on. Yeah, and, and the uh, Chrome OS is a good example because I, I said we don't have applications, we don't have storage. So Chrome OS, how are you gonna store your data? Well, you have to store it in the cloud. So for that model to work, you have to have a cloud storage model and you have to have the, the, you know, the software to be able to support that. So it is something obviously that's important to us as a company to develop because it's a prerequisite for some of the other things that we're doing. What was the other half of your question? Yeah. So the, the other question? Oh, oh. Well, let me tell you what I think most of the model looks like. What I see more often than not, we always thought in the early days we'd get the you know, deskless workers, the easy people, and the hardcore people. Generally what we're seeing is people move 100% of employees to Gmail and Calendar and Google Talk, okay? Um, because you, you don't generally want more systems than that, and you can use Outlook if you want. And, you know, they think about it. Usually they start down the path saying, oh, we'll just go with the Asian offices where we could use low cost. In the end, nine times out of ten, they come to the conclusion we're moving everybody there. Now, docs, or you might call it the applications, what have you, the kind that are sort of analogous to office, that is very different. There's virtually nobody at 20,000 people who are just office, you're out, Google Docs, you're in. What you see, and Todd mentioned this from Genentech, and, and I'll tell you the way it worked at Google. You know, Google has about 20,000 employees. When Gmail was live, we had 20,000 people on Gmail day one, right? Docs was launched. We didn't um, have that many number of people when <laughs> Gmail well, that's was true. launched. Okay. We didn't have that many. But, but, but it was 100% uptake, right? What, what you see, because we look at active users by every service, by, and we can see it by domain. And at Google, Docs and Sites since then has now become about the same as Gmail, seven-day active users tw about the entire company. And that's what you see from others, which is, they go live 100%, and then the docs and sites, the collaborative products, over usually a year or something like that, will grow to be just as, just as much used. But it's organic as opposed to a big, big switch. Okay, so we probably have time for just one more, one more question. Um, gentleman over here. It's coming. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Timo Vitikainen from Elkotech. And the question is related to the fact that some countries do have the firewalls. Do the enterprises need to be worried about the Chinese government firewall and its impact on the Google cloud-based services? You want that one? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't want that one. Well, this is where I pull rank. You take it. <laughs> um, we don't store user data in China, and we very purposefully have, have done that for either consumers or businesses, because we absolutely need to make sure you know, we're able to protect our users' data against any improper encroachments on it. So, um, uh, so th there's one thing. There are, there are, you, you can have users in China accessing our systems, 
Um, and we do occasionally have spats. I don't know. Well, how would you describe that? <laughs> Issues that, about accessibility uh, of our content from China. Uh, but uh, but it generally, for in our, through our applications, that it works quite well. The data is not hosted in China. That's the, kind of the short version. That's correct. OK, so we're bang, bang out of time now. So can I just, can you all just thank um, Alan and, and, and Dave for <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Thank you.